Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. We're glad that you are here today, whether you're joining us uh, from Klein Campus, Center Court East, Center Court West, or if perhaps you're joining us via online, maybe from some wintry location like Baltimore, or we are particularly glad if you are joining us today from our brand new Woodlands campus for the very first time, joining us from up in the Woodlands, amen. We give thanks to God for His uh, grace and for all of the people who have worked so hard to make that campus a reality, today is the first Sunday, and we are thrilled that they're joining us. We're glad that all of you are here. We are in the midst of a sermon series that we're calling Breathing Room. We're talking about uh, the need to stop, take stock of our lives, and ask, what is the quality of my life? The beginning of a new year is always a good time to do that. Do I enjoy breathing room? Not only in the sense of margin, scheduling, calendaring, that sort of thing, but really all aspects of life. Am I enjoying the quality of life that Jesus referred to when he talked about the abundant life or the full life? So far in the series, we've talked about things like our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, uh, our relationship with our finances. Today we're going to look at another aspect of uh, having breathing room in our lives. And to do that, we're going to be in the book of Philippians. If you need a Bible, just raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one that can be yours to keep if you need it. A reminder also that we, uh, we like for our sermons to be interactive. Uh, during the course of the sermon, you may have a question we're going to ask that you not jump up on your seat and ask in the middle of the sermon, but rather, if you would, just send us a text or an email to the locations that are listed there on the screen, and then in our postscript video, which we produce after the message, we'll be glad to address those. Perhaps we'll get at some of the issues that there just wasn't time to get to in the course of the message. To begin with, let's uh, pause for a moment and pray together. Father, thank you for today and for the privilege that we have to be in your house, to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to uh, fellowship with our friends here at church and to be uh, energized and invigorated for another week of living for you. Thank you for the gift of your word, for its ability to speak truth into our lives. We pray now that as we turn to it, uh, your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, just as you promised, and guide us into all truth. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, I think you would probably agree with me that few things in life have the capacity to rob us of breathing room like worry and anxiety. Depending on the severity of the worry and anxiety, sometimes it has the capacity to just take all of the oxygen right out of the room, sometimes quite literally. I don't know if you've ever experienced a, a panic attack or if you've ever observed someone have a panic attack, but the primary external indicator is what? A breathing issue. Short, rapid, labored breathing the individual just doesn't feel like there will ever be enough oxygen in the whole wide world to calm them down, like their lungs will never, ever be full again. It is a terrifying experience, more often than not brought on by worry and anxiety. Now, thankfully, not all worry and anxiety produces that kind of response, but nevertheless, I think you'd probably agree that any measure of anxiety diminishes quality of life. We're not living it in the way that God intended us to live. I know Becky, my wife, and I are moving through our own season of anxiety right now. It's a season that many of you have already moved through. You've passed through successfully. You've come out on the other side. Some of you have even 
come alongside us to, to assure us that it's going to be okay, that we will get there, that we will be just fine. And uh, uh, encouragement notwithstanding, as much as I appreciate it, nevertheless, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say, yeah, we're, we're kind of worried because we are at that crucial stage in life where our eldest child is about to become a licensed driver. <laughs> and that's not a reflection on her driving skills. She's actually a pretty good little driver. It's more a reflection on us. And I am amazed at the number of thoughts that pass through my brain that heretofore never presented themselves for consideration. Why isn't she there yet? Why isn't she called to tell us that she's arrived? Did you hear that ambulance go by? I wonder that. I mean, my hair was already gray. I don't know what's next. I don't care to join the ranks of Pastor Ken. Nice guy and everything, but I like what little I have left. That's our situation. But the fact is, every season of life, all along the way, is chock full of potential for worry. E each stage of life has its own set of issues and concerns. High school seniors thinking to themselves, I wonder, you know, where am I going to go to college? Uh, I wonder if I'm even going to get into college. Graduating college students wondering about job possibilities. Are there going to be any out there? Is the economy going to take a nosedive? Am I going to be out of luck as I go to look for gainful employment? Young woman wondering, you know, will I ever have the opportunity to be married? Another young man thinking, oh my gosh, I'm getting married. <laughs> young couple gets married, ties the knot, sets off on their adventure Wondering, you know, will we ever be able to buy a house? What, what's life going to be like for us? One young couple uh, painfully, painfully wonders, will, will we ever get to be parents? Another young couple is suddenly hit with the realization we are about to be parents. And then, of course, parenthood all throughout has loads and loads of opportunities for anxiety and worry, finally you reach that day where you look at each other and you realize uh, we're, we're empty nesters. And that has its own sense of worry and concern. I understand it only lasts about five minutes, but... <laughs> I also understand that nowadays the term empty nester is, it needs to be used pretty loosely. The birds tend to come back <laughs> anymore. Not, not in our day, we left. But you keep moving through life and uh, retirement suddenly is looming and you're wondering, did we save enough? Are we going to be okay? And then, of course, for all of us, there are those end-of-life issues, illnesses, the possibility of, of moving through life without our spouse. Each stage carries with it. It's just part of the human experience that things are going to happen. That's not an if, that's a when. Our circumstances are going to be such that we will have opportunities to be worried, to be anxious. So what are we to do with all of that? If, if, if that is our reality, how are we to live in such a way that we really do have breathing room in the midst of an anxious, broken, sinful, unpredictable world? Well, that's what we hope to learn this morning, or today, by looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians. The book of Philippians is in about the middle of your New Testament. Um, we're going to be in chapter 4, looking at just two verses, verses 6 and 7, verses that are probably familiar to many of you. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It would not surprise me to learn uh, that there are some here, certainly not everyone, but perhaps there are some here who right about now are thinking to themselves, oh, okay, 
I see where this is going. We've set up this problem, this difficulty, and now we've got this pat Christian answer, this this ready-made, turnkey Bible answer. Just pray more. We'll all be okay. How simplistic, how easy. Well, if that's your bias, if if that's your perspective, I, I can understand how on first blush you might come to that conclusion. But I'm going to ask you during the time we have together to to set that perspective aside because Paul really is getting at something much deeper than just pray and it'll be okay. He's getting at uh, a perspective, an attitude, an approach to life that if applied, if taken seriously and applied, really can bring genuine breathing room, genuine peace in the midst of of the most anxious of situations. There's a couple of things about this passage in particular that jump out at me, the first of which is that Paul is advocating here a lifestyle. He's not simply suggesting an occasional behavior, something that, that we need to do from time to time, but rather Paul is suggesting in these verses that we take a particular approach to life as a whole. I'm afraid that many people treat these two verses like a broom. Now, where does a broom typically stay in your house? I'd be willing to bet it's probably not in the living room or the family room or right out for everyone to see as a part of the decor. No, typically a broom is in a closet somewhere. And when do we pull it out? When there's a mess. And we only have it out while we're cleaning up the mess. When we're done with it, it goes right back in the closet. And I am afraid that many of us take these two verses and use them in a similar fashion. When things get tough, when things get scary, when things get anxious, when oil prices go down and stay down, when the stock market is going down, when our kids aren't making good grades, when there's difficulty in the marital relationship, whatever the case may be, that's the time to run and hold up these two verses and just pray and expect peace. But that's not what Paul's talking about. No, Paul's talking about something much more expansive, something much more inclusive. That's why he uses words like anything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. He's talking about lifestyle. He's talking about perspective. He's talking about overall approach. We should be cultivating a lifestyle of prayer. And then secondly, not only does he command us to take this lifestyle approach to pray, but he commands us to do something else that's that's very easy to just jump right over. It's very easy to miss if we're not paying attention. You'll notice he says, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Now, what's that all about? Why why does Paul throw in that curious little prepositional phrase? It's almost as an afterthought, but believe you me, it is not. It is quite central to what he's communicating here. The reason he includes that little phrase is because therein lies the key to being set free from the bondage of worry and anxiety. It's not only through prayer, but it is through prayer with thanksgiving that we suddenly begin to find ourselves set free. It has, thanksgiving that is, has a marvelous capacity to set us free from the bondage we can experience to worry and anxiety. But like prayer... It's something that has to be cultivated. It's it's not a one-off thing. It's not we find ourselves in trouble, so we offer up a quick prayer of thanksgiving. No. Paul's advocating, encouraging, commanding even that we become people who pray with gratitude continually and that it marks our lives. And as we do so, we suddenly begin to find ourselves living a different quality of life. To treat this passage uh, like a broom would be akin to me sitting here on a, on a Sunday morning and, and looking up at the stage and thinking to myself, you know, 
I think the band really could use a violinist today. Despite the fact that I don't play a violin, it, it's really needed, so I'm just going to jump up there and do the best I can and make all the noise I can. What's it going to add? Nothing. What's it going to improve? Nothing. It's just so much noise because there's nothing behind it. Nothing's been cultivated. Just like any skill, a musical instrument, uh, a, a gift to play athletics, to repair cars, to cook, whatever the case may be, Practice, perfect practice makes perfect. Diligence, putting forth effort. And the same holds true in cultivating the skill of being a grateful person. We have to think consciously about that and implement that in a very intentional sort of way. Otherwise, I have to think that if we're just one-off thankful people, just when we get in trouble, I would have to think that to some degree it comes across as so much noise in the ears of God. He has to sit and wonder how much is really behind that attitude, that request, that offer of thanksgiving. So how does it work? Practically speaking, if we're going to take this whole attitude of gratitude seriously, what does it do on a day-to-day -day basis to set us free? Well, the first thing that it does is that gratitude has the ability to set us free from the need to be in control and the illusion that we really are. The need to be in control and the illusion that we really are. Does anybody here know a control freak? Anybody here sitting next to a control? You don't have to answer that. That's, that, that's okay. Yeah, it's been my observation that control freaks are easily among the most anxious people on the planet. Why is that? Well, it's true for a couple of reasons. For one thing, they spend an inordinate amount of time making sure that everything is under control and anything that might possibly spin out of control, they've anticipated. In fact, they spend so much time thinking about what might happen, what could happen, the possibilities of all that might go down, they are unable to live in the moment. They're unable to enjoy the moment the blessings of the moment, the peace of the moment, the breathing room of the moment, because they're thinking about things that haven't even happened yet, may not ever happen, because those things just might be out of their control. And the other reason they're so anxious is because, to be quite frank, they are living in a fantasy. It's an illusion that any of us are in control about much of anything. And despite the fact that reality is slapping us upside the head moment by moment, reminding us that we are not in control, control freaks are convinced that they are. And it is exhausting work to live a fantasy, to pretend in the face of so much reality. It cannot be fun. It can only be tiring. And it certainly does not promote breathing room. Now, before we're too hard on our control freak brothers and sisters, let's just be honest here. Deep within each and every one of us is an inner control freak. And in the right set of circumstances, the right sort of situation, it can come roaring out of any single one of us and try to clamp down on the situation and manhandle and manipulate it to our way of thinking and our way of doing. Truth be told, that's exactly what's going on with me and my young driver. I don't have peace about that situation because I'm not in control. Because I'm not the one behind the wheel. That's when I feel peace, when I'm driving and she's over there. Or better yet, she's at home. <laughs> but I am learning 
that when I move away from that controlling, manipulating sort of approach to life and choose by an act of my will to take an approach to life that is prayerful and that is filled with gratitude, God begins to remind me of several truths that restore peace. He reminds me, first of all, that he created her and he loves her infinitely more than I ever will. He reminds me that she's not really mine. I get to have her for just a season, a blink of an eye. I get to parent and pour into her, and then she's off to be her own person, to be God's woman. He reminds me what a joy it has been and is to parent her, that she's a good, responsible girl, and that part of my stewardship of this good, responsible girl is is helping her get to this next stage of, of growing up. When he begins to remind my heart of all of these things, and I embrace them with gratitude rather than trying to embrace the wheel myself, suddenly there's breathing room. And there's peace, and there's comfort. Now, I'm not so naive as to think that, oh, yeah, just pray a prayer of gratitude, and it's all going to be gravy from here on out. I'll never have another anxious thought. I know that's not true. But we're talking about lifestyle. We're talking about perspective, overall perspective, And when I embrace God's perspective and when I am grateful for what he has given me in her and this new adventure we're stepping into of her becoming an adult, there's a breathing room there that I didn't have otherwise. Gratitude sets us free from the need to control and the silly illusion that we ever were in control. Another thing that it does is that an attitude of gratitude, an overall perspective on gratitude, has the capacity to set us free from self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. You know, by definition, a self-centered person is looking out for number one. It's all about me. It's about my needs. It's about my concerns. I've got to look after me. Nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to care for me, so I'm looking out for me. And because this kind of person has systematically excluded both God and other people from their lives through their self-centeredness, they have a lot to be anxious about because there's a lot on their shoulders. They're not letting anyone else share the load. They don't even understand that concept of others sharing the load because it's all about me. If any loads are to be carried, I'll carry mine and you carry yours. Otherwise, let's just don't bother each other, okay? What they don't understand is that we have a God who loves us who has promised to care for us, who has promised to be present with us, who has given us brothers and sisters to help bear one another's burdens, as Paul says. Last week we talked about the importance of relationship and how necessary relationship is for breathing room. If you're a self-centered person and you're systematically excluding God and other people from your life, Before long, you're going to be without relationship. You're going to be isolated. You're going to be alone. And that is an anxious place to be. But the only person to blame is the person in the mirror. Because God is always there. And God's people are here. Ready and willing to be a part of our lives. One of the great blessings of my life is the opportunity to serve on the FaithBridge staff. It is a staff that uh, I contend is, is second to none. We have such 
wonderful, godly, loving people here. I, I just pinch myself every day that I get to work with such a fine group of people. And one that I have enjoyed getting to know recently is a young man by the name of Alex Nunez. Some of you know Alex. He's a part of our Bridging for Tomorrow ministry, uh, our, our ministry to the community down south of the Beltway. Recently, he was uh, telling me his, his life story. And if you know Alex, you know that you're not going to find many other people in this world who are as loving and serving and gracious and kind as he is. The guy is just a bundle of love. And he's going to share it with as many people as he possibly can. I, I learned early on that when you greet Alex, it's not a handshake. The guy's coming at you, arms wide open, looking for a hug. He's just a, a loving person ready to help at a moment's notice. But I've come to learn it hasn't always been that way. You see, Alex was born in Honduras into a poverty-stricken situation and not too long after he was born, he was essentially abandoned by both of his parents. His mom left and went to the U.S. to look for work, and his dad just left. His grandmother, very graciously, took him in and did her best to raise a very energetic, a very rambunctious, and a very angry little boy. The abandonment, the poverty... All of those things were working in his little heart, helping him to understand that life isn't fair and life isn't fun, and if anything's going to come of it, it's going to be up to me. And he learned pretty quick, too, that a big part of making it in life included these, included one's fists. And he developed a reputation for being an angry little boy who flouted authority you didn't want him in your school. You didn't want him in your preschool. You just didn't want him around because when Alex was around, there was going to be trouble. So he was shuffled and moved from here to there. Finally, at the age of eight, the opportunity came for him to be reunited with his mother here in the States. It was a chance for a fresh start, but he pretty much just picked up right where he left off. And by the time he was 14... The school district that he was a part of at that time invited him to leave, to move on to another school district because of his violence and his anger and his refusal to submit to authority. They just could no longer tolerate that. Still poverty-stricken, still angry, still hurt, so many wounds unaddressed in his life just wanted to lash out at anyone and everyone, just as soon hit you upside the nose as to say hello. But then when he turned 17, through a series of events that have God's fingerprints all over them, Alex came to know Jesus. And it was about as radical an about face as I have ever witnessed. I mean, he went from being a violent, angry young man to one of the most loving gracious, gentle souls you'll ever hope to meet whose two priorities in life are to love God and to serve other people. When I asked him about it, I said, how do you account for this rapid turnaround? Here you've had a lifetime, 17 years of living one way, and yet after this encounter with Christ, suddenly you're going in another direction. And he said, you know, Dan, I'm just so grateful that God saved me, that he loved me and saved me. I'm so grateful that he called me to himself and he called me to serve him, that my heart is just overflowing with love for him and for other people. And I said, man, I'm convinced. I see it day after day in your life. Gratitude has immense power to change our lives and to give us breathing room, to help us understand we don't have to control every situation. That's not our job. We can let the anxiety of control go. We don't have to make life all about us because it's not all about us. 
We can surrender ourselves to the love and care of our Heavenly Father and the blessing of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we step into that kind of lifestyle, prayer and petition with thanksgiving, suddenly we begin to understand and experience a peace that passes understanding. In other words, there's no way to describe it. It is beyond words. I'd have to think, in a crowd this size, a little bit of anxiety and worry came in the room today. And I'd be willing to bet that a fair amount of it probably goes far beyond who's going to win the Super Bowl tonight. <laughs> Deflated footballs and all. No, I imagine there's some folks sitting right here who are carrying some mighty, heavy, heavy burdens. Jesus is here with you and extending to you a truth he'd like for you to receive. And it's up for you to appropriate that and implement that. He can't do that for you. So I want us to close our time together by praying together. I'm going to ask you just to stay where you are, to bow your head with me and we're going to walk through a time of prayer where we begin to cultivate this attitude of thanksgiving and give God a chance to set us on a different path than perhaps we've been walking to the present. Would you pray with me now? Why don't you take a minute in the quietness of your own heart, simply confess to God our failure, your failure to be grateful. Father, we acknowledge to you that uh, so much goodness, so many blessings, Watch care, provision, love. All of these things come into our lives and we, we do take them for granted. We forget that they are gifts from your hand to us. Please forgive us. Cleanse us from that sin of neglect. And place within us a, a, a heart that is sensitive to every blessing of who you are and what you are doing in our lives. Make us, O oh God, a grateful people. Take just a moment and um, simply offer prayers of thanksgiving for the, the blessings that immediately come to your mind as you think about being grateful, what, what, what are the, the blessings that are simply there and readily present to you for you to say thank you for? Spend just a moment and thank God for those blessings. Father, we thank you for the gift of life itself, for the provision of food and shelter and clothing, of friends and family. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of salvation that we have through his shed blood and the promise of eternal life. And then finally, Go back in your mind 24 hours to where, wherever you were 24 hours ago from this moment and then walk forward in your mind to where we are now and all along the way reflect on how God has blessed you and how good God has been to you in these last 24 hours. Blessings both big and small. Simply take a moment and make that journey of gratitude.
Father, we could be here all day and still not recount the many, many ways you have loved us. Thank you for bringing us to this new day that when we awoke, our hearts were beating, our lungs were breathing, that you were present in our lives and that you call us to something better, something higher, something richer than what we have known. In and of ourselves, we can never become the grateful people that we should be, but by your power and by your grace and by the indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit, all things are possible. So move now in the hearts of your people. Draw us to yourself and teach us to be grateful. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan Slagle, who just continued our series on Breathing Room. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. So today in Postscript, we're going to look at two things. One, when does general healthy concern become a sin? And two, how do we practically go about cultivating this attitude of gratitude? Okay. So let's start with the first question. All right. um, as I listen to the sermon and I think about um, this idea of worry and anxiety, mm -hmm. what comes to mind to me is when does my concern about something or general concern about things I have to do, um, when does that cross over into a worry or sinful type of anxiety? I mean, I have to be concerned about something. Sure. Like I have yeah. to make decisions. Um, yeah. So how do I do that without it becoming worrisome? I understand. Um, to be clear, we are not called to a life of apathy. Okay. Uh, Jesus was obviously concerned about things. He was concerned about the lost people of Israel. He was concerned about his mission. Uh, he was concerned about his disciples, that they carry on the mission. So his lifestyle, his teaching, all of that uh, communicates to us that, that we are not to be apathetic, that there are things in life we are to be concerned about. But where is the line between concern and sinful anxiety? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. You might think about it this way. Suppose I have uh, in my hand, the palm of my hand, um, an expensive, a small, delicate, fragile, expensive vase. Okay. Well, uh, if it is fragile and it is expensive and it is in my hand, I, I need to be concerned about that. I need to be careful with it. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing there. What I do not need to do is grasp that vase to the point that I damage it, that I damage myself, that I cut myself there because of my grasp. Well, in a similar way, I think we need to hold the concerns of our lives toward God in a palms up fashion. We're not letting go of them entirely. They're, they're still there. I still have to be a parent to my daughter. Mm -hmm. I still have to provide for my family. I still have to be a responsible pastor of the gospel. All of that's there, but I'm not clutching it to the point that God cannot have access to it mm. whenever he wants and, and do with it whatever he wants. Um, I think if we can cultivate that sort of approach to the cares and concerns of our lives, we will live in that healthy place of paying attention, of being appropriately concerned, but not to the point of taking undue responsibility and then stepping into sin. Good. That's a good illustration for cool. that. Okay. So we had a um, question come in here. I'm going to ask you from someone in the congregation. Okay. Um, how do we practically cultivate an attitude of gratitude without relying on ourself? So self-reliance and the control freak, mm -hmm. that can impact gratitude as well. So how do we do sure. this without relying on our on ourselves? Okay, well, 
to a degree, it's going to have to be self-reliant. I mean, n nobody can do it for us. You know, we, we've got to take responsibility for that aspect of our relationship with God. And the best way that I know of, honestly, is to practice. I, I make it a part of my quiet time to do what I did with the congregation today. Each morning that I am with God, I go back to the previous morning, 24 hours earlier, and in my mind, I walk through that entire 24-hour period, not, not obsessively, but just thinking about the, the major points of, of the preceding day and giving myself a platform from which to say thank you to God for, for what He did because every day has new and unique blessings. It would be very easy to fall into a rote routine of thank you, Lord, for... My salvation, thank you for my job, for my family. Uh, we're we're going to lose interest. But I have found that that daily inventory of what God has done keeps it fresh for me, keeps me aware of how God is intervening and active in my life. I think beyond practice, um, we do reach a point where we develop an I. Mm -hmm. I am a budding artist. And I mean like barely budding artist. Here at age 52, I've decided to take up painting and drawing. Not that I have any skill. It's just something I want to learn to do. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm learning as I read books about how to do this is that an artist learns to see the world differently from everybody else. You learn to look at it and discern things like depth and perspective and nuances that otherwise you would just completely miss. Well, it's the same with gratitude. If I am working on being a grateful person as I move through life, I'm going to notice things. I'm going to notice, wow, my three girls are healthy. What a blessing that is. Uh, I'm going to walk through life and realize we have never missed a meal, ever. Mm -hmm. uh, going overseas can really heighten that, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, but it can even get right down to the nitty-gritty of things. You can go for a walk one day, and in a parking lot full of concrete, suddenly there is life, a, a flower is uh, poking itself right up through a crack in the concrete and you realize uh, beauty is everywhere. Mm. So you give thanks for that. Um, I think if you're intentional, if you practice and you look for it, it'll happen. It's good, it's good. Well, thank you for the message today. Sure. And I am grateful for you thank and you. for the message <laughs> that we had today. Um, and so you'll be back with us again next week yep. as we continue Breathing Room. Yep. Um, so keep your questions coming and join us back here next week for Postscript. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.